dog. It was just skin and bone, and he rescued this dog. But that dog was just surviving on what he could get on the shore of the beach. Many Christians are doing that. They're surviving on what they can, the little scraps that they can pick up along the way. We will never win this world with that kind of a mentality. Church doesn't even like church anymore. Forget about the reality of changing the world. Christians don't even like Christians anymore. It's quite obvious because if they really loved one another, they'd hang together. The people you love, you want to be with. Christians don't want to be with Christians. So, I mean, if we don't believe in us, why would the world believe in us? And the truth is, if that's how we feel about us, what about God in us? You know, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? In other words, he, John says, if you, if you hate the, your brother, you're not even a, a believer. You can't live in hatred unforgiveness and call yourself a believer it's inconsistent with the word of God it's a contradiction to the truth and yet so many Christians are fragmented because of broken relationships disappointments offenses and they blame the church for human frailty they say I'm not going to be in the church bunch of hypocrites Wow, that's what I said. But I'm sure many of you have been there before and have heard others speaking about it. And if it wasn't for the reality of the Lord coming to me and rescuing me from me, I would be bound. I would be useless. I wouldn't be a carrier of God's word. Because he came to me, I've reached hundreds of thousands of souls, started thousands of Bible schools, done all these things. But if it wasn't for that, I'd be sitting in my, in my lounge now my kids are big, I wouldn't be babysitting them anymore. I'd be just lazy sitting around complaining how that the church has failed. The truth is the church hasn't failed. A couple of individuals have failed. Our politicians fail us, yet we keep voting. Doctors fail, but we keep going. Medications fail, but we still keep taking them. We don't write off the whole medical profession. We don't write off our political system. We just have to accommodate. We make adjustments and things go wrong in the church. And, and the truth is, because we see each other and we see the frailty of humanity, we see the weakness because we are the product of the cross, not of our, our, our ability, our genius, our creativity, our discipline. And, and, and that's not what saved us. It's the fact that we came to a point where we realized, I need a savior. And we called on the name of the Lord because we realized our discipline, our morality, our behavior, our generosity, our sacrifice is not enough to gain us access to God. It needs the blood of Jesus through the new and living way. It's the only way that a man can be saved is to believe in him, to call upon his name and to turn from their own weakness and their frailty and lay a hold of him. And he hasn't given up on the church. Now, he does address the church. You see that in his, um, his message through John on the island of Patmos to the seven local churches. He had things to say because it's his church. And if he doesn't like the way it's going down, he has every right to come and say, I need some adjustments here. And with those, uh, with those adjustments, he gave some very strong words that if you don't get this right, your lamp is going to be removed from you. You know, there, it wasn't, you know, somewhere in the message of grace, and I love the message of grace, somewhere in the message of grace, we've forgotten to read the words of Jesus. That he did bring some warning, some pretty strong warning. Yet he is the God of grace. He is the God of mercy, but it's not anything goes. This is the state of the church. Get it right. The prophet said to, to the 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 um, followers in, in Jerusalem who were building their paneled houses. And if you look at the word paneled, it means luxurious house. Well, his house was in ruin. He said, consider your ways. Well, Leon's unpublished translation of consider your ways is, get your act together, pal. Get this thing sorted out because the, what you are doing is bringing 
failed systems, you're sowing, you're not reaping. Your purses are not keeping what you earn. The land is famished. The, the, the results of your being engrossed in your own thing is affecting your very success. I've given you the land to prosper and now you're in poverty. Because you are doing your own thing and you're not engaged in the highest priority, which is your first love, and that is to worship the Lord your God and to serve Him. They were bringing polluted sacrifices, not just in the offering, but their heart was polluted. And they were thinking they could get away with it. And the prophet comes to them and says, get your act together. You wouldn't do it to man. Why are you doing it to God? You wouldn't give your governor a blemish sacrifice. Why are you giving a blemish sacrifice to God? So it's a, there is the grace of God. There is the mercy of God. But there's also the warning that comes from God. And I often think if, if Jesus were to appear to someone today in a, an encounter with a message for the church, would it all just be, I'm pleased with you? I love you? Or would there be some demands for change? I believe there'd be demand for change. He'd say, I'm not, I'm not happy with the way people treat my house. That it's become the leftovers. In Leon's, again, modern translation is, you give me the, the, the doggy bag instead of the best, the cream of the crop, the first fruits. You give me the leftovers, the dregs, the bottom of the barrel. You need to consider your ways and start to reprioritize your lives and make my house a priority. It's a priority to him. I will build my church. It's his priority. What's he doing right now? He's building his church. When souls were saved in the early church, the Lord added to the church daily those who have been saved. He didn't just say, I'm adding them into the journals of eternity, into the Lamb's book of life. I'm adding them to the church. Leon's understanding of that, it's very simplistic. When you're saved, you're added to the church. Because you're a member of His body. You're not just some arm or leg floating around. You are meant to be connected, drawing the life. From the body, it's not just a head and then there's bits of the body floating around. It is, it is connected, interrelated. And then if you take the, the imagery of the bride, we're not a one-night stand. We're not a date night with Jesus. It's a marriage. We are living stones fitted. Well, living stones fitted means that we are connected to him the foundation and one another we're not just like living stones thrown in a batch like you drive through new england and you see these walls that go back to the early pioneers they're just stones gathered together to form some kind of a wall they've fallen over these things growing we're not like just thrown in a big bunch sitting there it is a building a temple unto god it is a holy construction. We are connected and interrelated. And when that living stone is removed, that portion of the wall feels the impact of that removal. The Lord added daily to the church, those who have been saved. Paul also put it this way, you baptized into the body of Christ. So just like... We are immersed or baptized into his body. We become a part of his body. So when you are born again, you are not just delivered from sin, Satan, sickness, disease, poverty. Uh, you are also immersed into the body of Christ. You become a part of him. Amen. And when you disconnect yourself from the head and from the body... What happens? It dies. It cannot exist on its own. And so it's because we don't see Jesus in the church. We see our frailty, our weakness, the failure of man, the failure of some of our systems. We just throw the whole thing out. You've heard the saying, you throw the baby out with the, not bath water, bath water. <laughs> bath water. <laughs> 
Have you ever met anyone that's thrown the baby out with the bathwater? I haven't. I have met the person that said, you want to eat your, you want your, you want your cake and eat it as well. I have met people that get cake and don't eat it. I believe you to eat what's set before you. Caramel is really nice. Chocolate is very nice. I mean, who doesn't want their cake and eat it? You have to be pretty sick. Now, I may not eat for a week afterwards, but I'm going to eat my cake. But I've never seen anyone throw the baby out. Why? Because the baby is precious. The water may be a little polluted because of the body, and there may be some pollution around us, but the body is actually loved by God. So much so that when Saul was doing damage, Jesus came to him and said, Why are you persecuting me? He didn't say, Why are you persecuting me? The, the church, my followers, my people, he said, why are you doing this to me? In other words, when you touch Jesus, you touch, when you touch the church, you touch Jesus. It's his body. When you touch the body, you touch him. The head feels it. He is present in the church. The lights came on, but, but we forget, we know it. We're two or more gathered. We know it academically, theologically, but we actually, in the process of our activities, we actually lose sight of him in the church. If we did not walk by faith and we walked by sight, it would be quite a scary thing coming into church, seeing angels, seeing Jesus, <laughs> maybe some demons manifesting as well on the way in you know wouldn't it be scary to see into those dimensions we are not allowed to see in that realm because we're not living out of our senses we're living out of our spirit but because we don't see him doesn't mean he's not here if we could see him it would affect the way we sing it would affect the way we pray it would affect the way we give it would certainly affect the way we attend. Because if you could see Jesus and receive from Him, it would have to be a real critical thing that would keep you away. I mean, in all reality, if I knew Jesus was here with 100% certainty, I would move from the sunshine state and I would come and live with these liberals around here <laughs> and adjust to your high taxes very quickly. <laughs> Do you hear what I'm saying? I would make every adjustment. In fact, if I lived in Africa, I would sell up everything and I would move to Tolland. I would move right here. Because I wouldn't want to miss Jesus. I would be at every meeting. I would get there early, way before anyone. I'd be first in line. And I'd be the last to leave. They'd have to like drag me out. The ushers wouldn't have to flick the lights because that wouldn't impress me to get out. If Jesus is here and I could see him, I'm going to anchor myself down. I'm going to crawl up to him and lay hold of his robe, his feet. I'm going to be there. Am I right? Because I could see him. Now, because I don't see him doesn't mean that I, I don't believe he's yeah. I am preaching he's yeah. I was in America a few months and there was this um, appearance of this image of the Virgin Mary on the bank window. Um, and uh, it, it happened in Clearwater, St. Pete. And uh, you can Google it. It was quite a phenomena. You couldn't get within miles of that bank window. There was traffic jams. They actually had to put a mobile police station on the corner just to keep control. I eventually made my way there. And we were in real revival at that stage. But I was watching this thing because the news, the local news had it every day. People were flying in there. Hotels were packed. Chinese, Korean were flying in, Japanese were flying in, Brazilians were flying in. In fact, there were so many Brazilians, they changed the name from Brazilian to Gazillions. (laughs) 
So many. And they were easily recognizable by their little flags. They were walking down the flags and hundreds of Brazilians, Brazilians following them, running to the window. And there they would come bringing flowers, bringing offerings, bringing handfuls of money and putting it in front of a bank window. There was no priest, there were no nuns, there was no one collecting. People were just throwing their wheelchairs, canes, people coming with some hope to see this apparition that Mary would somehow leap out of that window and touch their lives, only to find that it was the toxins in the water that they were, you know, they were splashing against this window, creating a chemical reaction that kind of looked more like, if I have to be brutally honest, it looked more like Mother Teresa than Mary. Personally, when I saw Mary, she didn't look anything like that. In the little Sunday school books, she looked totally different. And at first, I was quite outraged. I thought, this is idolatry. This is the kind of stuff that makes us look weird to all society. Idolatry in the church, praying to an image of Mary. I've got to be honest, I'm thinking of it theologically. I'm, and I'm criticizing this prayer and this faith towards an image on a bank window. Because even the Bible says if, if, if an angel appears to you, Satan appears to you masquerading like an angel of light, there's, you can have uh, things appear that could look like God but can actually be a demon. Anyway, I'm thinking of this thing academically and theologically, and then suddenly it hits me. If people hear that Jesus is in church, they get to hear that he is in church, there is not enough hotels that could contain the people that are going to come. There is not going to be a building big enough to contain those that are going to come. You understand, the problem is we are not revealing Jesus in the church because we haven't really come to the realization that he is here. His name is Emmanuel. I will not leave you nor forsake you. I am with you always. Where two or more are gathered, there I am even in your midst. He appears in the midst of the seven lampstands. We read it, we grasp it theologically, but in our faith realm, we haven't yet quite seen him in the church. One day, I, I have these little things where I go through growth phases and I'm trying to discover the way and the glory and the anointing. And I had a little prayer. I wouldn't say it was ritualistic. It was passion. But I would pray, oh God, please show up. <laughs> it, it sounds good, but he has shown up. 2,000 years, he showed up. Emmanuel, God with us, came, died the grave is empty as we beautifully sang, and he is with the church. I am with you. He is the head of the body. He is the foundation upon which we are built. He is the, the bridegroom. He is the leader of the armies of heaven. He is all these things to us. He is the king of the kingdom. He is with us, but we know it theologically, but not in reality. God, please show up. And then he said to I said, God, would you please show up and move in power? He said, as people will draw near to me, I will draw near to them. The measure that they use is the measure that will be used back to them. And then he began to speak to me very straight. It was a very, very straight conversation that the Lord had with me. One of the clearest that it was like almost like a conversation. He said, Leon, the 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 problem is that they don't realize that I'm in the church. Because if they knew it, they would show up. You asking me to show up, but I'm saying you need to get them to show up. I am here. That happened 25 years ago in Chicago. I'm having this conversation with the Lord. He said, if they will draw near to me, I will draw near to them. If they will seek me, they will find me. If they press through the, the barriers that exist, they're going to access my glory, my power. But we haven't seen him yet. People attend out of tradition, 
out of religion, out of obligation, out of guilt. They don't come seeking the Lord. They come just the way they've come for 20 years. Genuinely born again. But it's a meeting. We sit in our rows. We sing our songs. We do our offering. We do our prayers. We listen to the teaching. But we're not seeing Jesus in it. We're not coming with an expectation for Him. We just come out of it's the right thing. We're faithful. We're loyal. We're committed. But there isn't that anticipation. Think the greatest meetings you've ever been in, think about it, have been pregnant with the atmosphere of miracles. God was no more manifested then than He's in any meeting. It's just we accessed what was there with our faith, with our anticipation. He's not closer any time people think, well, there was a, a day when God moved. God's always moving in the midst of the atmosphere of faith. There isn't a day of miracles. There's a God of miracles. We think, well, we're in a season of revival. No, the windows of heaven are open from the resurrection. It has never been a heaven that is closed to the saints of God. You have equal access, uninterrupted access to Jesus. To the Father, to the Holy Spirit. Heaven is open to us. We just don't really believe it yet. How do I know? Because people just don't attend. If they saw Jesus, and that's where I wanted to start before I got distracted by myself. Mark chapter 2. And again he entered Capernaum after some days. And it was heard that he was in the house. Immediately, many gathered together so that there was no longer room to receive them, not even near the door. And he preached the word to them. And they came to him, bringing a paralytic who was carried by four men. And when they could not come near him because of the crowd, they uncovered the roof where he was. So when they had broken through, they let down the bed on which the paralytic was lying. They were so desperate to get to Jesus that they broke open the roof. Roofs were expensive back then too. You build a house or build a church, one of the greatest costs, probably about a third of the building will be the roof. And and they broke open the roof. I'm sure that they offered to pay for it. But they wanted to get their friend healed. They were that desperate because Jesus was in the house. They heard he was in the house. We've heard it, but we've heard it the audio We haven't heard it with the ear of revelation that would affect the way we attend, the way we pray, the way we give, the way we take the word, the way we lay hold of his presence. You know, in the old days, we used to sing a song, reach out and touch the Lord. He's passing by, you know, just like the woman would lay hold of the edge of his garment. He is in the house. He is in the house. My ministry has had a couple of highlight meetings, not loads, but maybe 50 or so where the tangibility of God, not just the, the academic, the theological, I've had, you know, the difference between a miracle and a sign. A sign is when God shows or manifests himself in such a way that there's no doubt. I was in a meeting in a place called Cahokia where the white ceiling went blood red. There was no way anyone could do it. It was white and it went blood red in the meeting. And then smoke began to blow through the ceiling. So much so that people ran out the building screaming, it's on fire, it's on fire. When they got outside, the building was encased in a dome of light. And within the light was laser flashes of lightning. People had called the fire stay, the fire brigade, what you call fire department. They were on their way over. People were freaking out. And I was in the meeting. I stayed in the building trying to get the people to stay. And angels appeared right around the building. Not only I saw it. Many that were in the building saw it. angels. The whole building was surrounded by angels. 
people were freaking out, screaming, crying, falling, worshipping. Because they could see that God just pulled the curtain back and allowed us to see what it's like with Jesus in the house. Well, of course, people came from everywhere as they heard what had happened. And I said to the the pastor, don't you dare market this. Don't you advertise this because people would be disappointed. God's not doing this every Sunday. This is a sign, just a glimpse that God allowed us to see. And um, there were many of my friends were in that meeting. Um, uh, Scott, you will know, like Bob and Pam Armstrong, you will know uh, uh, Tony and Fran Faith. They were in there. Tony's uh, friend's mom uh, came into that meeting. She was such a dear, I think she was a Catholic lady. She came in and she was all dressed with a hat and gloves and living like in 1970, no, 1957. Came in like that and, and, and she don't lay hands on me, I don't want to fall, I didn't even have to, I standing here, the power of God just lifted her, she went flying, she got saved and filled with the Holy Ghost that night, her hat went off, and it was just, (laughs) but it was a sign, I saw the reality of the presence of God, the next night, um, the pastor was, that was assisting me, he was a musician, Tom McGuire, um, he was playing, and, and, and we could hear the sound of angels. Because I had a single musician. He was very good. And I, I, I could hear trumpets. I could hear harps. I could hear voices, thousands of voices. And I thought he had pre-programmed. I was just like thinking natural. And, and he was like tears rolling down. And we actually captured that sound on the sound. It's not like it was just in the meeting. It was captured in the sound. I don't make this stuff up. Seven times it rained inside the meeting. Just the glory of God was manifested. Golden rain began to fall upon the people. Power. Bulgaria, I mean, the gypsy church was radically awakened in that meeting. Because as that happened, God gave me the ability to speak in Turkish for half an hour to the to the gypsy pastors in the spirit i wasn't even aware of it the glory was so intense but he allowed us glimpses i'm telling you the god of those signs is just as present tonight we just don't see him are any of you from puerto rico carolina you know carolina near the airport there, Annie Rodriguez, I'm sure she's still pastoring. You can check this out. Annie Rodriguez Church. I'm inside the building. It begins, the wind of God, like the day of Pentecost, comes rushing into the building. Shh, fills the house. People are just flung from seated positions, just flying in the power of God. Falling out. Annie Rodriguez, I mentioned the name. TBN was filming at TBN Chicago was there with me filming the meeting a little Pentecostal lady she's old she comes she's drenched she said when the wind came in a cloud appeared above her and it began to rain on her she took her shoes off she's speaking in Spanish of course I can cafe con leche uno dos tres buenos dias buenas noches buenas tardes and Dios le bendiga I can do that, but she's speaking so fast, I can't even pick up what she's saying. Pouring water out, dripping down. She said when the wind blew in, a cloud appeared, it rained on her. And uh, she had been brought up in Azusa Street. Her parents were Azusa Street Christians. And she had been in those early meetings. She said that's the first time since Azusa Street that she has experienced God like she did when she was a little child. The Spirit of God hit me. I went out under the power. It's gone for maybe 10, 15 minutes where God began to minister to me. So what you've seen in your ministry is a trickle compared to what I want to do. It's a trickle compared to what I want to do. He said, I'll let, it, I'll let you see the rain on her as a sign. This is a sign. There's been a sprinkling. There is a deluge coming upon my church. 
And that was the first of the seven times that it rained inside the building. And, and it was a sign that he's in the house. And what he did then, he is doing any time there is faith and hunger, but we just can't see him. We're not pressing into the glory for his tangibility. Academically, we know it. Theologically, we know it. Some people are really desperate. They seek in him in the house. But the average, the majority, you know, it's that... that 10% core, desperate, hungry, open, teachable, and then you've got this peripheral that are accommodating. Can you imagine if every Christian who is born again, connected to a local church, and began to worship and serve and pray and give and carry the light, the impact we would make in our society, but we don't even believe in church anymore. It's kind of a place we go to rather than a people that we are. So we have to have the shift like this morning when I spoke, there came a download, a shift, a, 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 an awakening, a reality of God in the house. We've got to get that reality again. And then when we hear it and know it and carry it, then the word will get into the community and everyone will want what we've got. There's no doubt in my mind. I've seen it in, in clear water as thousands of people flew in from all over the world, drove from all over the world to get to an image of Mother Mary on a bank window. I stood there with my mouth hanging open as people brought handfuls of hundred dollar bills and just placed it on the wall, just on a little shelf wall bringing their offerings, bouquets and flowers and gifts, people there in wheelchairs praying, crutches praying to an image. And I'm thinking, my God, this is so wrong and yet so right because I see how desperate people are for a holy visitation of God's tangible presence in this nation. They'll come from everywhere. We, we need a shift in our, and I, I repeat it purely for the sake of those who weren't here this morning. We have to get away from understanding that salvation is a personal access to God. Amen. It is a personal access to God. It's a corporate access to God. It's not one or the other. They coexist equal in priority and importance. We have been so raised... And, and you hear it, even evangelists say it. Now, if you raise your hand and pray this prayer, you don't have to join this church. We're not asking you to, to join this church. We're not asking you to attend church. We're asking you to believe in Jesus, to receive Jesus. So we're already brainwashing the new converts that church is not important. We're already suggesting to them. I was with a, a, a radio evangelist and I'd just given this talk and he said, now Leon, would you please just uh, uh, throw out the net and give an altar call for those who want to get their lives saved? And I gave an altar call and said, please pray this prayer with me. Believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead. Confess with your mouth that Jesus is the Lord. You'll be saved based on that. If you've called upon his name, I want to tell you now that you're saved. And he immediately came on the air and said, now that you've prayed that prayer, now remember you don't have to attend church. This is a personal access to God. And I'm, I'm ready to just like slap him on the side of the head and say, why are you suggesting that church is not important? And now I'm going to really get brutal. I hope I don't tread on your toes. I don't know what you've preached, but just bear with me for a few minutes to allow my, my simplicity to be heard. Um, go with me in your Bibles, please, to... I'm going to really jump here, but I just feel a shift coming right now. How many of you are getting ready to receive from God? There's going to come a shift in your thinking. Um, um, go with me in, in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 5, 25. This has been taught over the years in every marriage conference that I've ever attended and all the ones that I never attended, I'm quite sure that this would have been used as the foundation scripture for that. Um, Ephesians 5.25, 
Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for its sacrificial love. Verse 29, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes it and cherishes it. We know that as Americans, we love and cherish our bodies. We feed them three times a day. And uh, bottles of water, making sure we're well hydrated. So we, we know how to nourish our body, cherish our body. Just as the Lord does the church. So the Lord nourishes and cherishes the church. I want you to get this. He's making a shift. He's using this as an analogy to show love, commitment, sacrifice, care. He's actually not talking about marriage. He's talking about Christ and the church. We have just understood this about marriage. And he goes on. For we are members of his body. We are members of his body. Members are connected, attached, belong. We are members of his body. We go on. And of, of his flesh and of his bones. For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife. And the two shall become one flesh. We use this in our marriage. Now you leave your mother, and especially your mother-in-law. She's a, she's a witch. Leave her. She'll destroy your home. <laughs> You've all heard it being taught. Am I right? I know I'm exaggerating. I'm using this law of extremes to keep your attention. Leave your mother and your father. He's not speaking about just leaving in your mother and father and becoming a unit at home. He's talking about you leave the natural, you're now going into the spiritual dimensions because listen, yeah, he goes on. This is a great mystery. Not that you leave your mother and your father and become one flesh. This is a great mystery. But I speak concerning Christ and the church. We've stopped before Christ and the church. This is a great mystery. How you fall in love, leave the, the, the mother and the father. You become one flesh. You co-exist uh, together as one. You become one in, in, in soul, in spirit, in marriage, in finance, unless your nuptials say differently. <laughs> but he's not actually speaking about marriage. He's speaking about the church. Now here is the, the, the problem why it's become there's not this loyalty to the church. Now we teach God, marriage, home, family, church, business. When was God and church ever separated by an interjection called marriage? You can't have God, marriage, church, as if it's some little addendum that we can throw in there. God and church are one. It's not God, the head, marriage, natural, flesh, responsibility, then church. As if it's something that we put in the structure, this order. So we have taught this. And people have bought into it. And what they're interpreting is this, that you Put your family ahead of church. Because church is a place we go to rather than a people we are. So we have subtly sold them this thing. The church isn't that important. Family is more important. So now when there's t-ball, soccer, swimming, um, cheerleading, that comes before church. So a whole generation of kids has been lost to sport because family... Am I saying neglect family? That's not what I'm saying. Am I saying uh, don't allow them to have any interest? That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that we as believers have to understand church isn't a, a place we throw in under something else. God and church are one. Amen. There it is. A great mystery. Christ and church have become one flesh, one bone, one body. Then comes business, hobbies, interests. 
And later on, you'll find that people actually shift church down, shift church down, shift church down, and these things slot up in priority. And then the church gets the leftovers with the busyness of life starts to take over because it hasn't been shown as a priority, this great mystery of being one with him. You know, you guys have been really saved by my lack of technology because I forgot to hit start. I'm going to start preaching now. (laughs) That's the longest non-minute of my life. Start. You got another 44 minutes, 58 seconds of me. <laughs> Pastor Weston go, oh my goodness. That's a good place to say, go on, Leon. <laughs> if we can get a revelation, you've all heard this. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. Notice that revelation just isn't for an individual. It's actually for the church. We need a revelation to hear what God says to the church about the church. Because I've done the math. Faith comes by hearing. Understanding comes by hearing. Ignorance goes by hearing. What's happened is we are not teaching the priority of church. We are teaching the concepts of man. And people have bought into it. So even at salvation, now this isn't to join the church. This is to get your life right. So people are interpreting our little phraseologies that what's more important is you avoid hell and make heaven. That's what salvation is all about. No! There is a hell to shine, a heaven to gain, but there's a life to live and you cannot do it on your own. You have to belong. You are baptized into the body. You are added to the church. You are fitted by God into this holy sanctuary. Without that, you die. Without that, you become like that dog on the beach trying to live, but there's not enough to sustain you. And eventually you will die. You'll become diseased. You'll become weak. And you make heaven. But the world around you will make hell because you are silenced and offended by the church. And you let everyone know how bad church was and how good God was. And they thought, well, I just want to avoid hell and make heaven. I'll just have God for heaven. But they don't know God on earth through the church. The church is his signboard, living epistles read by men. They will never get nearer to God than being in church. Other than crossing over into the portals of eternity. Because he is in the church. He is with the church. He is operating in our midst through us. Not only to us, but to them through us manifesting his glory the whole earth stands on tiptoe waiting for the manifesting of the sons of God we are not manifesting him to society we're manifesting our frailty our weakness our sin our corruption our hypocrisy and the world is bought into it we don't even have a voice to them anymore because we don't even have a voice to ourselves a huge percentage of Christians have no capacity for the things of God because they've bought into the lie. The church is not important. They're not growing. They're not maturing. Their ministries are not being shaped and forged. You notice Jesus said, go into all the world and make disciples. He didn't say, go make casual adherence. Go make disciples. Do you know what the word disciple means? Convinced learner. Not just a learner. It's a convinced learner. It's someone that is bought in and has forsaken everything to follow that teacher which is Jesus everything is placed on the altar of sacrifice because they have bought in isn't that go make casual at church attendees go and make committed convinced disciples I sound mean but we don't make disciples We make 
church adherents. I would like to say we make church members, but most churches don't even believe in membership anymore because they're scared to teach a commitment because it's offensive. But you can't work for Walmart without buying into their policy manual, into their culture, and going through an orientation and signing off that you will do business their way. You can't even take your kids to play soccer. What do you call it? Yeah, soccer, football. You, they can't even join the football without a medical release, a signed agreement about that thick that you don't even read the fine print. You just sign away. I sell my kids into slavery to Satan, into the sport for the rest of their days. And even when they're old, I'll release them from all parental authority. It's like, who has ever read the agree button when you get those upgrades for your computer and you just buy into a website or some app? You just hit agree. No time to read it. You just want what it's got. And you sign away their lives to that sport. <laughs> I'm just kidding. They can't, they can't play for that team. Even if they're highly gifted and called, unless they buy into that agreement. And then we have people attend church with no commitment, no agreement, because we're afraid to offend them. So we just, again, weaken any voice of authority from heaven, the standards of the Word of God. Anything and everything goes. You just come in on your own terms and conditions. And I'm thinking, that's why the church is weak, because we have not shared the conditions. They just all want the benefits, the privileges, but not the conditions, the responsibilities. We don't even want to use that word that you would have some kind of a responsibility. There's somehow we seem to be taking over. Listen, God wants to possess you. For him to possess you, he's got to dispossess the flesh, the demonic the world, he says, friendship with the world is enmity with God. In other words, you can't love God and the world. When you love the world system and the world's operations, it's a conflict to this salvation. The last days, people will be lovers of self, lovers of pleasure, unloving, have a form of godliness, deny the power thereof. That's the generation of the disconnected, fragmented believers who are more into themselves than into the things of God. Yet, if you speak to them, Shandai, Shandai, Shandai. They're not spirit-filled. They just speak in other tongues. They're spirit-filled 15 years ago, 20 years ago. They've leaked out a long time ago. What you're hearing is their experience, not the fullness of God. If you get full of God, you want the things of God. When you're full of God, if you do not be drunk with wine. When you are full of wine, that wine takes effect in your body. You start to do things that you wouldn't normally do. Say things that you may not say. You understand? You'll behave uh, differently. Why? Because the influence is taking over. It's like the man that was stopped by the police and he was under the influence of alcohol. He said, I'm not under the affluence of alcohol. When you are God intoxicated, when you are full of God, then what God believes in, you believe in. He really, really believes in church. And for us to say we are spirit filled and not love church, Christ having loved the church, gave himself for it, is a contradiction to the word of God. It's not the truth. And yet, we have bought into that and it has weakened our witness to this generation. Church is God's idea. It's not Pastor Weston's idea. It's not Leon's idea. It's God's idea. If it wasn't for the fact that Jesus came to me and changed me through an encounter, I would still be saying Christians are a bunch of hypocrites. Why? Because I was offended, wounded by our frailty, our weakness and the carnality of man. But you know what? I am so persuaded about him that I can forgive. I can look past human weakness because I've got my eyes fixed on Jesus. And when I see a person do it right, I thank God. When I see them do it wrong, I thank God for his mercy and grace that is bigger than our frailty and weakness. 
I've chosen to not view man according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. I dare to look past their weakness to see their potential and possibility. Doesn't mean I put up with everything that goes, but I'll minister into it with compassion and love and truth to the best of my ability to redirect them to the word of God. Let me try and close this. Flesh and blood has not revealed this. I got it by revelation. And I want to give you that revelation because it's, if we're going to seek God, there's something about seeking Him in the sanctuary. Um, have a look at this. Um, uh, this verse here in Psalm 63, 1 and 2. The Psalm of David when he was in the wilderness of Judah. Say wilderness of Judah. It's context. Oh God, you are my God. What is that? Personal relationship. Early will I seek you. So you can seek him because you need salvation. And you can seek him because of salvation. David is seeking him because of salvation. Early there does not mean you have to get up uh, when the bats go to bed and the birds start chirping away. Um, I do like early morning. I've got to tell you, I like the early morning because your cell phone won't go off. Most people are sleeping. The smell of coffee in the early morning is just so much better than in midday. It's just something about, and all the coffee drinkers said, amen. <laughs> it's just something about that first cup of coffee, the smell of it brewing in the early morning, the fresh air. You just have to live it. And, and, but he's not talking about getting up early here. He's actually saying, you are my highest priority and I will seek you as my first and my greatest priority. Amen. Early will I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. It's born out of passion, desire. Not that God is in any way holding back on us, but the more we discover of him, the more we want to discover of him. There's so much more. There are so many dimensions in the glory that we have not touched. And so David is in the pursuit of knowing God personally in glory in this discovering and is born out of his appetite if we don't have a spiritual appetite you won't hunger for the things of God desire the things of God he says my flesh longs for you in a dry and thirsty land the wilderness where there is no water so I have looked for you in the sanctuary to see your power in his glory he loses consciousness of the wilderness and of the natural and he uses that as an analogy to describe his desperate spirit in his pursuit for God in the sanctuary. He understands God's in the house. Amen. The tabernacle of David would become the temple of Solomon. That this, the, this way of worship would be moved from his tent to God's house that he so desired. He had an image that was born inside of him that you can't contain God in a house, but he knew if the house of Obed-Edom can be blessed by the Ark of Covenant, if we can get Zion to have the manifested presence of God, doesn't matter what armies come against us, they will be defeated. Doesn't matter what happens in the environment, if it's, if it's a famine, our land will produce a harvest because the glory of God is the government of God it's the protection of God it's the provision of God it's the peace of God and that's where I want my people to be he sees him in the sanctuary in this corporate expression of worship and sacrifice God manifesting himself to the people so much so that when God manifested in the Moses tabernacle the fire fell ignited the offering God came, manifested tangibly, visibly, consumed the sacrifices and the fire was lit. They just had to keep fueling that fire. Moses was commanded, keep the fire burning. God will give the fire. The everlasting fire of God was meant to be with the people of God. But it would take not just God, man would have to cooperate and create that environment of faith and worship and sacrifice and bring what is needed to create an environment for God to move. I said, God, you added daily to the church. It seems like we are being subtracted. 
He says that it's impossible to add to an environment that is not conducive. I'm not just saving people from their sins, but I'm saving them to be added to the church. But the church doesn't believe in the church. So why would I save them to add them to a system that's going to make them twice dead? In his sanctuary is his power and glory. Yes. Psalm 27, 4. And I know this is Old Testament. Bear with me. I know I'm reading Old Testament. But I want to show you the heart. One thing. What's one thing? Priority. I have desired of the Lord. That will I seek. We're talking about I seek. That will I seek. You will always seek after what is the priority of your heart. That I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. He understood the importance of temple worship. He understood, you are my God. I have access to you. Watching the sheep, playing my harp, killing the lion and the bear. Are you with me? You know, that's one dimension. Personal, you are my God. But I want to know you in glory and power in the sanctuary. Corporate. To behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. You see this in the sons of Korah as well. In Psalm 84, verses 1, and I'm not going to read all the way to 8, but how lovely is your tabernacle, O Lord of hosts. My soul longs, yes, even faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Understanding corporate presence. When the glory came in the priest could not minister it was so intense so powerful they could not minister the tabernacle the glory came in the temple the glory came in the church the glory came in day of pentecost the mighty rushing wind tongues of fire presence fell they were all filled with the spirit every temple is dedicated in an encounter of glory Later on, he goes on, each one appears before God in Zion. They weren't just going to Zion academically and theologically. They were to come bring in their offerings with their hand to worship God. Each one means everyone must get to Zion to worship. Even those that lived outside of the region had to travel to get to Zion to worship. I don't care the distance God was saying. I know it's going to be hot. I know it's going to be a long distance. I know there are thieves on the road. I know that circumstances are always going to be trying to distract you. Make the changes and get to Zion. Amen. We teach, no, don't worry about it. Stay at home. It's okay. I know my voice sounds weird there. <laughs> <laughs> In Acts chapter 7, 44, and then later on 46, 50, our fathers had the tabernacle of witness in the wilderness as he appointed, instructing Moses to make it according to the pattern that he had seen. It had to be built according to the pattern that was seen. We are not building church according to the pattern that is seen. We just build it by tradition, culture, religion, placing it in our little system of order. We don't understand the pattern of God. The tabernacle had exact dimensions. Everything had an exact way of being laid out. The church is the same. Formed on the apostles and prophets, the revelation of the Old and the New Testament coming together in apostolic authority, introducing church, the government, the order of God in corporate worship. It hasn't been given. And so people just have a form of godliness because they haven't been taught the priority of the glory and the power in the sanctuary. And it goes on, who found favor before God and asked to find a, a dwelling for the God of Jacob. But Solomon built him a house. However, the Most High does not dwell in temples made with hands. As the prophet says, heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. What house will you build for me, says the Lord? Or what is the place of my rest? Has my hand not made all these things? He's, it's not that he's saying... Church and church buildings are unimportant. We've got plans there expanding the mission. God does build, move in houses. The upper room was a house God moved. The house of Cornelius, God moved. You can meet under a tree, but I'll tell you what, a building is far more comfortable. 
especially here in winter or Florida in summer, every afternoon it rains. I was just in Barbados and I was busy preaching. The rain came so hard that you couldn't hear with amplifiers because of the roof being corrugated iron. You could not hear my voice. I had to pause while it rained for 10 minutes because they could not hear my voice. If we were outside in the elements, that would have wrecked that meeting. Thank God for houses that we can meet in. I have met in little huts in villages. I've met under trees. I've met in hotels. I've met in huge church facilities. I would rather meet in an air-conditioned building any day than under a tree. Because God does minister in buildings. He fell in the tabernacle. He fell in the temple. He fell in the upper room. He fell in the house of Cornelius. In my first church that I pastored, the the presence of God, people would drive past and feel the pull of God driving past the building. They would walk in and feel the atmosphere of God in the house. That's what got me saved. I walked into a church. I felt the presence of God in the place. First Chronicles 29, furthermore, King David said to all the assembly, my son Solomon, whom alone God has chosen, is young and inexperienced, and the work is great, and the work is great, and the work is great, because the temple is not for man, but for the Lord God. Church is not for the comfort of man. We do everything for the comfort of man. Church is for the glory of God, that we may see his power and glory. It's to create the atmosphere for, in the Old Testament, God is enthroned in the, in the praises of his people. Now in the New Testament, God is enthroned in the people of his praises. God visited them. God dwells with us. There's a huge difference. In David's heart The temple is not for man, but for the Lord God. Now for the house of my God, I have prepared with all my might. You never go to the things of God casually, second rate, leftovers. It demands all your might. Because I have set my affection on the house of my God. Love is what pulls us to the house of God, not legalism. The early church met daily, not legalistic, but because of faith, because of desire. They, there was not a day they did not want to pray, fellowship, worship, give offerings and, and care for one another and sit at the apostles' feet and learn about Jesus. Not because it was commanded, it was because love drew them. The problem is the church doesn't love church anymore. They say we love God, but you can't love God and hate church. We love God, but we hate church. That's not consistent. God and church are one. So David was passionate about the church. Jesus was passionate about the house of God. Why were you searching for me? He said to his parents, didn't you know that I'd be in my father's house? He had a passion for the house of God. Later on, when he drew, drove out the money changes, they remembered, zeal for your house has eaten me up. Zeal. There were another way of saying that. Passion for God's house will consume me from the New Living Translation. Jesus was passionate about the church of God. In fact, so passionate, Christ, having loved the church, gave himself for it. He didn't just die so that we could avoid hell. He died for a glorious church. For whom he will return. He's not just returning for us. He's returning for the glorious church. Without spot and without wrinkle. In 1 Corinthians 3, 16 and 17. You should know that you yourselves are God's temple. God's house. He's not speaking as individuals. This is your temple. It is. It's not just an individual. You, he's speaking to the people should know that you yourselves are God's temple. God's spirit lives in you. If any person destroys God's temple, then God will destroy that person. Why? Because God's temple was holy. You yourselves are God's holy temple. So individually we are his temple, but also corporately we are his temple. Ephesians chapter 2 verses 19 and 22. So now you non-Jews are not visitors or strangers. Now you are citizens together with God's holy people. You belong to God's family. You belong to God's family. You believers are like a building that God owns. (laughs) We are like a building that God owns. I'm reading from the English revised version that just puts it very nicely. 
Uh, that building was built on the foundations that the apostles and prophets prepared. Christ himself is the most important stone in that building. The whole building is joined together in Christ. And Christ makes it grow and become a holy temple in the Lord. Becomes a holy temple in the Lord. We are a holy temple in the Lord. There was a construction of David. There was a construction of, of uh, uh, different builders. Hezekiah and Ezra and Nehemiah. As they all constructed Jerusalem and the temple. Solomon and Moses there was constructions but yeah God is the one constructing this it's a temple constructed by God for God Amen. that we may in that place grow and become a holy temple in the Lord and in Christ uh, we dwell together as he's talking about corporate uh, both the Gentiles and the Jews you are being made into a place where God lives through the spirit so we're not just a people we are a place where God lives or as it says in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 and 5, coming to him as to a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious. You also as living stones are being built up a spiritual house. But we're not just a spiritual house. You also are a holy priesthood. He's using these analogies. One dimension, we're his house. The other, we're his priesthood. To offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God with, through Christ Jesus. That's not personal, that's corporate. So in the house, there is a, we are the house, and we are the priest, and we are offering up spiritual sacrifices. This is our corporate gathering. We call the household of faith, the temple of God. I'll close with this. Why do people leave church? Why do we quit? I see the early church met daily. Later on, Hebrews writes and he says, let us not uh, forsake the assembling together. So somewhere between Acts and Hebrews, they started dropping off just like our generation. And yeah, he comes riding by the Spirit saying, "You, as the day appears, you should be gathering together more. So if this was written about 2,000 years ago, how much more now as the day grows closer of his appearing and yet we see more and more people staying away rather than coming together not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some not all but exhorting one another and so much more as you see the day approaching why do people stay away i'll tell you why number one they've lost their passion for the lord when you lose the passion for the Lord, you lose the passion for the house of God and the things of God. Number two, they're too busy, but they're actually not too busy. It's wrong priorities. Okay. Number three, I think the church has lost its appeal, appeal to our society and to our generation because they've not seen consistency in our actions to our message. And that has become visible to the people. And they've done the math. They say, if these people really believed in it, they would do what it takes. But they see our inconsistencies and our lack of stability. And they say, this isn't real. And they, they back away. I think also if the meetings become weird, if we do things that are outside of the, the realms of God's word, they become distasteful to those especially who want the deeper things and the pure things of God's word. And so we have to be careful that we retain God's order. There's a right way to do things, not to impress man, but to win the heart and presence of God. And that doesn't mean quenching something, but not everything goes in the household of, household of God. And we need to be uh, careful that our practices are not things that we're just bringing in because we have issues in our lives and we need to somehow be seen and have this visibility. We have to have a sensitivity that we don't become weird because it pushes people away. And I'm, I'm not speaking about the spiritual manifestations of God. I'm speaking about the manifestations of people who don't know how to handle the presence of God, just like Peter, let's build tabernacles, yeah, let's just do what we think we should do. Whoa, that's not what's needed, yeah, building a tabernacle for Moses and one for Elijah and one for me. Just enjoy the glory. The glory is that tabernacle, that presence. But we start to want to do something for God because we don't know what to do in the glory. So people make stuff up and they start introducing things that were not needed. 
because they bring shadows and, and types and try to bring it into the, the, the manifested glory. We don't need shadows and types. We just have, we have the substance. I was to think that people, to be honest, don't like our preaching because the whole culture is don't make me uncomfortable. And so people are now watering down the word of God, but in so doing, uh, they are building audiences, but they're not building the church. They've so watered down. They don't want to teach blood. They don't want to teach commitment. They don't want to teach tithing. They don't want to teach giving and offerings and anything that would place some kind of a burden on people. Let's avoid that language. And so we're just raising up people who have church on their terms, very watered down, very social, very nice, but not raised in truth and commitment. And lastly, we don't see Jesus in the meetings, even though he's here. And when they see Jesus, they will come. Tomorrow night, I'm going to share continuation. I seek not my own. I seek not my own. I'm going to share the difference between selflessness and selfishness. Selflessness is the Christ-centered life. And if we become like we have prayed, let me decrease that he might increase. Let me become nothing that he might become everything. If we would truly lay down our lives for something bigger than ourselves, and we begin to seek not our own, but to seek him and his, the church, I'm telling you, will have the manifestations of God's power. He's not holding out on us. He's just looking for vessels that he can flow through, that he can trust. And then on Tuesday night, I want to deal with, I follow, I seek, I follow, the difference between seeking and following, what it means to be a true follower of Jesus. It's been wonderful to be with you tonight. Would you stand with me, let us pray, and I'm going to hand over to Pastor Weston. Then I'll pray for anyone that wants prayer afterwards. It's been so good to be with you tonight. I, I've got to tell you, I didn't feel any like resistance or barriers. Even if I did feel it, I just barged through it anyway. But I didn't. I just felt hungry hearts pulling the word, pulling the word, pulling the word. And I want to commend you for that. There's great hunger in your hearts. You hear out of hunger, out of uh, love for him. And I could feel it. I could feel it and sense it in the atmosphere. Um, I trust that we can get this word out to the disconnected Christians. Wouldn't it be great if the disconnected Christians could hear this message and maybe change their heart and mind about church in the revelation of the goodness of God in the house. If they could come in again and fall at his feet and worship him and pour out their tears and their love upon him and just get reconnected with him. Wouldn't it just be a marvelous thing if they could be like the prodigal, I will arise and go back to my father's house Notice that the son went back to the house. The disconnected son had to be reconnected to the father. You don't get that in the pigsty. You get that by going to the father's house. Even the Samaritan took the man and put him in the inn. There's a place of recovery. The church is the place where people can recover from the attacks of the thieves. When they're left bleeding and dying in the ditch, we not just get them out of the ditch, we put them in the inn where they can be healed. And there's a price to pay. Even though Jesus has paid for their salvation, there's a price for us that we pay to get them into the inn. There are things that we have to do. It takes you out of your way. There's a price to pay. It will take you out of your way. To grow the church will take you out of your way. To bring the hurting back to the church will take us out of the way. We're going to have to expend the oil and the wine. What we could have used for ourselves, we've got to use it for someone else. Pouring it into them, we've got to pay the bill for them to be healed. The church is not just for us. The inn is not just for us to have a comfortable bed. It's to bring the hurting and the dying so that they can be restored. There's a whole backslidden generation that needs to come back to Father's house. There's so many of our brothers and sisters lying in the ditch. And the, the Christian church is just passing like the Levite and the priest in our religion to the other side of the street. We need to go to the side of the hurting and the dying to bring them in. 
that takes sacrifice. How many of you have heard something from God tonight? Whose hearts were stirred in the revelation of God's love for the church? Any of you? What are you going to do about it? Well, yeah, you're going to act on it. You're going to pray about it. You're going to, I, when I say pray about it, what it means is, Lord, let this word become tangible. Redirecting my steps and my ways, my attitude concerning your house. Some things you can lay hands and impart. Some things you've got to stir up and meditate on and embrace. I think this is a word that demands not my hands laid upon you, but a embracing of it. How many of you heard God through these lips of clay? I heard God through me. I heard his passion for his house through me. I know Leon and I know God in Leon. I didn't just hear Leon, I heard God in Leon tonight. How many of you heard God through these lips of clay? Then the Bible says, receive the engrafted word that is able to save, even though you saved from your sins, this will save you unto the church. Because if you believe it, then he has the first fruits of a new generation that loves church. And doesn't just love God, but loves church, loves one another. The, the, the new commandment is not just to love God, it's to actually love one another. And that means being, when you love someone, you want to be with them. Do you remember when you first fell in love? You didn't want to stay away. You'd stay awake till like 3 o'clock in the morning. Oh, I just love you so much. I've got to say goodnight. I've got to go. No, no, don't go. Just another hour. I've got to work tomorrow. That's okay. Love will keep us alive. <laughs> love will sustain us. <laughs> But isn't that what love does? <laughs> you want to be with each other. We want to be with him. We want to be with each other. That's what love does. Hallelujah. I'm going to preach again. <laughs> You've got eight minutes left of my 45 minutes. <laughs> and the hour before that. This is so good. And you're not even tired yet. You are not tired yet. You are not tired yet. Say after me, I am not tired yet. <laughs> Put your hands on your heart. Say, God, please fill my heart with revelation of you and the church. I want to see you in the church. I want to see you in each other. I want to see you in me. And I want to see you in the church. Personal access. Corporate access. Renew the spirit of my mind. Grant my eyes to see. The eyes of faith to see you in the house. Creating a new loyalty. Creating a new passion, new desires, priorities changed. You and your church, inseparable. And I am in you, and you are in me, and we are in you, and you are in us. Thank you, God. Amen. Master. All right. Yay. <laughs> so good. Um, I heard you mention you would pray for people, but then I also heard you say not really a message for impartation. Which one do you want to go with? Okay. Gotcha. Gotcha. All right. So the message is something that needs to be caught and meditated on. But if you want prayer for anything, uh, Dr. Lean has offered to pray for you. So you're welcome to come up. Um, tomorrow night, 6.30, we're going to be praying from 6.30 to 7. And then from 7, we'll have some worship. And then Dr. Lean will be here again. So I hope I will see you all tomorrow night. Uh, there are a lot of practical ways to sort of walk out the, what uh, Dr. Lean has shared with us tonight. 
And uh, one of the ones is um, invite somebody or encourage somebody to come to church. So I'm just going to give you all an assignment. So think about at least one other person who is not here tonight. Could be from River or outside. And uh, just call or send them a text and just say, hey, I'm so excited to go one day because I know Jesus is going to be there. Would you come with me? Who's willing to do that? All right. Awesome. Okay, well, thank you for coming tonight, and God bless you all. And again, if you'd like to come up, if we can pray for you for anything, come on up, and we would love to pray for you. God bless you. You're dismissed.